trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestsellers, all they're hyped up to be. The Terrible Book Club explores whether or not you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. If you've ever seen a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Hello and welcome to episode 104 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Chris, and this is Paris. Hello. This time we read Ninth House, Alex Stern, <laughs> number one, by Leigh Bardugo. This was recommended to us by our friend Liz, who started reading it last year but lost interest and ultimately couldn't finish it. It was published in 2019 by Flatiron Books. If this is your first time listening to the show, what we do here at Terrible Book Club is read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination of the three. Sometimes, like today, we also read books that our patrons, listeners, or friends recommend. In general, though, we do the opposite of what most people do in a bookstore or when they're browsing Amazon. Usually this experiment results in a disappointing read, but once in a while, we end up liking the book. Okay, time to set up the world here. Let's start with our content warnings. Uh, aside from our usual barnyard language, this time we've got gore, drug use, ghosts, guns, ritual magic, our good old pal sexual assault, now in regular and ghost pedophile flavor, <laughs> and some stabbing. Yeah, today's a doozy. It's back, a lot everyone. of stuff. A lot of stuff. Back. Okay, well, uh. here is the summary on the back of the book. Galaxy Alex Stern, yeah, that's right, is the most <laughs> unlikely member of Yale's uh. freshman class. A dropout and the sole survivor of a horrific, unsolved crime, Alex was hoping for a fresh start. But a free ride to one of the world's most prestigious universities was bound to come with a catch. Alex has been tasked with monitoring the mysterious activities of Yale secret societies, well-known haunts of the rich and powerful. Now there's a dead girl on campus, and Alex seems to be the only person who won't accept the neat answer the police and campus administration have come up with for her murder. Because Alex knows the secret societies are far more sinister and extraordinary than anyone ever imagined, they tamper with forbidden magic, they raise the dead, and sometimes they prey on the living. Ooh. All right, y'all, there's um, there's quite a bit uh, of setup to get through here. I'm going to go through the characters and setting as best as we can, and then Paris is going to read the quite lengthy summary that we wrote up here. We've started doing a thing here where we summarize most of the book as much as we can so you're not completely lost while you're listening to the episode because we tend to bounce around quite a bit when we get into the sort of critique section here yeah and uh just to note that that our long summaries and of course the episodes um as a whole are spoiler full so if this is something you feel like you might want to read um maybe maybe skip it um, yeah, um, and I guess we can say up front before we get into any of the spoiler territory that this might be worth your time. All right. For our characters and setting, we are square in the middle of Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. You know, New England, the only place where anything occult ever happens in the entire U.S. <laughs> yep. This time with Ivy League flavoring. Mm. Our main character is Galaxy Alex, in quotation marks, because that's her, her nickname slash the name she goes by most of the time because Galaxy is a dumb name. Yeah, it uh, is. Galaxy Alex Stern, former troubled teen addict, ghost assault victim, now freshman Ivy League Illuminati Security Force member, also known as codename <laughs> Dante. Uh, yeah, that's, yep, correct. We've got Daniel Darlington Arlington, Alex's mentor slash lover, codename Virgil. I don't, yeah, I don't know if I would call him lover, but continue. It's sort of, yeah, we get there. 
Uh, then we have the ancient eight houses plus Leth, the ninth house. Le it's Leith. 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 Okay, I was I kept saying Leth the whole it's time. I'll Leith. go with your pronunciation just no, so we don't have that Le argument. No, my pronunciation is correct. It is Leith. <laughs> okay, all right. It's okay. not. It's not a Paris versus Chris thing. This is an established word. All right. Future Chris here to say, um, actually, according to Oxford's Learner's Dictionary, it's Leithe. So these houses, except for Leith, are real things at Yale. They are actual buildings and secret societies at Yale, such as Skull and Bones, which in the world of Ninth House uh, practices divination for stock prediction purposes, it seems. Yeah. With notable alumni like both George Bush's, John Kerry, and William H. Taft, real alumni of real Skull and Bones. Um, then we have Book and Snake, the Necromancy House. Notable alumni, ne necrom Bob. Necromancy. Necromancy. I say necromancy because it's, it's, ne fun. it's necromancy. It's necromancy. <laughs> Scroll and Key, which practices portal magic. Mm -hmm. Notable alumni, Cole Porter. Wolf's Head, who practiced therianthropy or shape-shifting, but they hate it when you call them it that. Charles Ives, notable alumnus. Mm -hmm. You have Manuscript, who practices mirror magic and glamouring things, so like your Hollywood-based entertainment thing. Anderson Cooper and Jodie Foster are members of this house. Yeah, Manuscript has other... They also have, like, drugs and stuff. Their whole magic... I find Manuscript's magic to be the most devious. Oh, yes, by uh, far. But continue. Then we have Aurelian, which practices logomancy, or maybe logomancy, Paris. Which logomancy. Tell me? It's logomancy. Okay. Which is word binding or contract magic. Very business focused, this one, I'd imagine. Um, there were some notable alumnus here, but I didn't fucking know any of them, so you don't get to hear any of that. Look it up. <laughs> then we have St. Elmo's, who is the elemental slash weather magic house, which I feel like I would either belong to that one or manuscript, probably, if I had to choose... Oh. And yeah, I don't know any of these. Oh, I'd much are... rather be in Leith out of okay. all of them. Um, and then we have Berzelius, which just didn't come up at all in the book. So <laughs> it was just well, sort of this mysterious eighth house that didn't do shit. Except it does exist. I mean, I, it has a Wikipedia. It says that it still exists. And the mission, its mission is that the unexamined life is not worth living. Um, and its mission statement is Berzelius provides opportunities for achieving insights through an open, honest exchange of experiences, passions, and opinions. This process prepares its members, whose diversity is highly valued, for an active, intellectually vigorous, and moral life, giving them a place and time for contemplation and reflection so that they might rise boldly to the challenges of their lives, devoted to good character, tolerant of others, and willing to serve their communities while forging links of mind to mind in a chain unbroken. I don't know what kind of magic that would translate to. Maybe some kind of like... It sounds like mind... Telep telepathy yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like some kind of mind shit. Um, but the book, yeah, the book literally says nothing. I don't know yeah. why she <laughs> was like, fuck Brazilian. She just couldn't come up with anything for that one. Maybe that's like the se you know the next step. in Because this is a series that actually just started. So there's another book coming out eventually. Also a Netflix series is in development. Go figure. A Netflix um, series, I think, for one of her other books, though. Not for this one. Oh, okay. Well, and anyway, maybe, then we maybe. have. I don't know. Anyway, then we have Leith, the ninth house, which is basically magic operational security force, the occult FBI, yes. if you will. All right, that's the houses, and you got Galaxy and Dar Darlington here. So let's get into some more characters. You have Dean Sandow, who is the dean or overseer of Leith House, sort of the guy in charge of all that stuff. You have Pamela. Pammy Oculus Dawes, Oculus being her code name within Leith. She's sort of the housekeeper for the house that Leith people can live in, slash research assistant, slash like sandwich maker. Yeah, <laughs> she's there. She's there to do research for the society and also kind of, yeah, be the sandwich maker when Virgil and Dante, you know, the code names of Darlington and Alex, when they come in from a mission, she's like yeah, make you a PB and J. They sound the slippers sound are in the sandwiches. Yeah, slippers are in the ottoman. You know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like that's her deal when she's not doing her working on her dissertation. You have Professor Marguerite Belblum, a professor in one of Alex's classes. It's Belbaum. Oh, Oops, the, Bel why is the L? Okay, I don't know. You, you, you okay, wrote Belbaum. this. <laughs> you wrote this part. I just, you edited this. I just fixed it. <laughs> You have Hallie Len 
Aiton and Ariel, various figures in Alex's former life as a troubled teen who are mostly all dead. Mm -hmm. Mercy and Lauren, Alex's roommates at Yale, uninvolved in any of the magical business for the most part. You have Blake Keeley, a classic uber bro, hot, rich dude rapist who uses magical means to take advantage of women, despite not belonging to any magical society. You have Tara Hutchins and Lance Grassling, the dead body central to Alex's investigation of shady dealings within the Ancient Eight, and her boyfriend, the suspected murderer. Uh, Detective Turner, codenamed Centurion, the police liaison for magical affairs in New Haven. The rest of the cops aren't in on this deal. I'm assuming the Leith just went to him and was like, hey, you want more money? Check this shit out. Yeah, yeah. They they find people they can target who are financially vulnerable um, and hope that they can secure their trust and discretion with uh, large payouts in, in uh, exchange for services, so... And then finally, we have the general various members of ancient eight houses that are suspected to be involved in the whole Tara Hutchins thing slash other shady magical stuff going on at Yale, like Kate Masters, Colin Catry, and Trip Helmuth. They all belong to various houses. They're honestly, they're barely going to come up here. They're just sort of like the SVU, you know, like the first person that gets the, the suspects in, S in an SVU episode. But it turns out it's not really them. That's them. <laughs> yeah. All right, All right, so, so that, here... that's your wind up here, Paris. Thanks, thank you, Chris. Um, thanks, Chris, for doing all that talking at the, at the outset. So um, herein begins the summary that Chris and I have constructed of the most important points in the entire book. This was almost a 500-page book, so this episode itself is going to be pretty lengthy, um, as as will the summary be. So um, buck, buckle up there, buckle in, and get get all snugged up in your chairs. Or wherever the hell you are in your jacket. Get all snugged up in your jacket. I don't know. All right. <clears throat> Assuming that you listen to Terrible Book Club outside all the time. Yo, I listen to most of my, in the normal times, I listen to most of my podcasts walking to and from work or like running errands or going to the gym or something. I listen to a lot of podcasts in the shower. Yeah, I would do that so if I'm I had a nude a good... podcast consumer is what I'm telling everyone here. I mean, a lot of people are. I like to listen to podcasts in the shower too, but I, right now I don't really have a speaker for that. Anyway, whether you are enrobed or nude, <laughs> prepare yourself <laughs> okay, for the get summary. Ready, everyone. All right. <clears throat> Galaxy Alex Stern is the impoverished child of a hippie mom, a Ladino grandmother, and an absent father. If you don't know what Ladino is, it's a Judeo Spanish shepherdic people uh, from Europe. She sees ghosts, and her interactions with the supernatural make her an outcast to her peers. With low self-esteem, no friends, an absent father, and a mother with no rules, Alex soon falls under the spell of a drug-dealing, abusing pedophile named Len, who she considers her boyfriend from late childhood into her teens. She is repeatedly traumatized, from spectral rape to actual rape to forced sex work to physical and mental abuse, and as a result, resorts to keeping herself in a continual drug-fueled haze just to survive day to day. She is plucked from this troubled life after being found unresponsive but alive at what appears to be a drug-related homicide, during which Len, the aforementioned um, awful abusive pedophile, Alex's best friend Helly, and several men were all killed. Due to the devastating nature of the wounds the victim sported and the amount of drugs in her system at the time, Alex is not a suspect. Instead, she is whisked away to Yale after Dean Sandow shows up at her hospital bed and informs her that he knows of her ability to see ghosts, or greys, as they are called in this world. Sandow is the overseer of Leith, a secret society at Yale that oversees the activities of the Ancient Eight, the other secret societies at the New Haven University that dabble in various forms of magic, ensuring that their activities are not brought to light and the members do not overstep certain boundaries in their magical dealings. Alex's ability to see greys without the help of other magic in particular, the use of Oros Cario, or Hiram's Bullet, an elixir that is unpleasant and sometimes deadly to ingest, is unheard of, and particularly valuable since Leith is often present at various rituals and castings of the other houses in order to protect such activities from the greys. Greys can be pains in the asses and attracted to anything living, since they so desperately want to be alive again. So things like blood, sex, greed, magic, even sugar, um, and most especially, occult rituals involving some or all of those things, attract them. Grave dust, poems about death, and certain herbs can ward them off. So, um, just to recap there, her ability to see greys is important because whenever they're doing rituals, uh, greys can try to get too involved and become too attracted to the magic and can break the ritual and cause really bad shit to happen. So, 
having someone who can just see them without having to do anything is really important. Alex is placed under the wing of Daniel Darlington, Arlington, a.k.a. Virgil, in order to learn the practices and rules of Leith while also attending regular Yale classes as a fake art major. Uh, that's the cover that Sandow and Leith gave to her to make it seem like she was a real admission to Yale. I think they used some manuscript magic to make it seem like she could draw. The two build a tenuous friendship that verges on becoming intimate but never really does until Darlington is captured and disappeared by some kind of black portal in the basement of a building at Yale on a routine weather magic recalibration tour. Alex learns Darlington was investigating something to do with the deaths of Bertram Boyce North and Daisy Whitlock, a couple who died in the 19th century in New Haven in a mysterious suspected murder-suicide perpetrated by North. North is a somewhat infamous Grey known as the Bridegroom who haunts the campus of Yale, who Alex frequently sees amongst all the other Greys. Darlington seems to suspect North was tied up in something fishy going on between the ancient eight. So... In the background of this whole Alex story, you have this weird, this old ghost murder um, that Darling is looking into that seems a little sketchy. Meanwhile, Alex becomes involved in the investigation of the current murder of Tara Hutchins, a resident of New Haven, when asked to by Dean Sandow in order to ensure her death was not involved in any of the rituals the ancient eight are known to perform on Thursdays, the night Tara was apparently murdered. So Leith's whole job is just to be, yeah, like magic police. So if there's a death on campus or something weird happens, they're supposed to investigate, write up a report, and then, like, if they determine that any of the societies did anything bad, there's, like, a tribunal. So At first, it seems that Tara's death is uninvolved with the societies, but Alex becomes increasingly convinced it did have something to do with them when she is attacked by a gluma, a variety of violent ghost murderer, when she continues to poke her nose into the investigation, led by Detective Turner, a police contact for the Ancient Eight. She soon finds out that Merity, a magical drug from manuscript that forces the user to become completely subservient, was being used by a student named Blake Keeley to rape women at the college. Blake is not a member of any of the Ancient Eight, Eight, and thus should not even have access to such a drug unless someone in one of the houses was stealing it for money, which would be a huge scandal and result in the perpetrating house being stripped of its tomb, which is the tombs of the houses are, are like the house itself, like the, you know, those big grand... Actual buildings that society exist. Society houses, in real yeah. Life. Yeah, so they refer to them as tombs, but they're not tombs. They're just giant mansions. The physical buildings where their magic is the strongest since it's built upon a nexus, which is a particular point of strong magic that is a rare find. So yeah, so these tombs are built on these uh, nexuses, nexi? Uh, I'm not actually sure what the plural of that is. Um, Where there's just particularly strong magic, and throughout the book they talk about how they're not really even sure how to create a nexus and what causes it. So that's why the tombs are really important for the societies, because... If they don't have the buildings anymore, then their magic isn't going to be as potent, and in some cases won't even, most cases won't even work. And because no one knows how to create a new nexus, it's not like they can just go down the street and build a new one. Alex attempts to tie together the various clues she has, which include using a ritual to find, to see through Tara's eyes at the moment of her murder, to see that her boyfriend or someone wearing her boyfriend's face with glamour magic stabbed Tara. The presence of Merity and the Gluma, Tara's boyfriend's ability to use portal magic to step away from his prison cell and attack Alex in Tara's apartment. Keep in mind, Tara's boyfriend is not a member of the societies and should not have magic. And her cursory knowledge of the politics between the various houses at Yale. She is assisted by Detective Turner and Pamela Dawes, and they cycle through various suspects' motives and methods until Alex finally determines that it was Dean Sandow who murdered Tara. Sandow, under immense financial financial pressure from both a recent divorce and the fact that Leith actually receives its funding from the other eight houses, murdered Tara in a botched attempt to create another nexus of magic, as well as cover up all the shady dealings going on, since Tara was the source of the Merity getting out into non-magical hands. Murdering her would allow St. Elmo, one of the houses, to have another nexus to build another tomb after they lost theirs, which would result in a payday for Sandow and Leith. Sandow was even the one who, who disappeared Darlington. He summoned a hell beast to consume him, which was the supposed portal that Darlington disappeared into. Um, it actually turned out to be the mouth of a hell beast. So, to recap, <laughs> Dean Sandow is the one who actually killed Tara because Tara um, 
<clears throat> Tara started out just, I think, dealing regular drugs or something mm-hmm. yep. and to two people and then got caught up. I, I don't know how she... I don't remember how she found... Oh, I think uh, she made friends with a girl who had a garden on like in, in like the greenhouses of campus and they started growing it because the Meridi was really expensive because there's only one person in the world who grows it in like Nepal or something. So anyway, some fucking kids at the society were like just trying to grow it for their grow it cheaply for their own use and they were using her to do it and then they also and Tara had a way of making shit Chris what was the stuff she was making it wasn't the Meridi it was something else she had like a jewelry making side thing that somehow was you know tied up no she had a a crucible for some reason from one of the societies and she was able to make something in it that the rest of them couldn't do. She was somehow naturally talented with a certain kind of magic and was making stuff for them. And as a result, she had leverage over them so she and her boyfriend could learn more magic, which is kind of how all that happened. Um, yeah. Oh, and, and we'll, get, we'll get to more details later. So, after Alex figures this out, she corners Sandow at a party being held by another professor at Yale, Professor Bellbaum who had previously offered Alex a summer job as her personal assistant. And Alex confronts Sandow with her knowledge of the murder. Just as she's confronting him, Professor Bellbaum bursts into the room Alex is talking to Sandow in and declares that this was all part of her plan since she is actually the ghost of Daisy Whitlock, fiancé of the bridegroom, who has, for nearly a century and a half, forcibly possessed the body of Gladys, her old servant, and continued to live on by consuming the souls of various women and wheel walkers, those who can see greys without the help of any other magical means. She knows that one wheel walker consuming another is what actually creates a magical nexus, and since she cannot leave New Haven, since her decay becomes more advanced if she does, she must stay there and pull other wheel walkers to her to consume. She has been doing so unbeknownst to any of the ancient eight, but has meddled in their affairs sometimes in order to continue living. If that last paragraph came out of fucking nowhere to you, don't worry, <laughs> it did to us too. <laughs> fucking dumb. All right. Alex is able to counter Daisy's attempt to consume her soul since Daisy assumed Alex was short for Alexandra and since Alex never corrected her that her name was actually Galaxy and knowing a name is a form of an intimate bond for magic to work properly, Alex, who has been able to allow Grace to possess her for increased strength or speed, which is how she murdered everyone at that crime scene she was picked up at by allowing the ghost of her friend Helly, who overdosed to possess her and take her revenge on everyone at the scene, allows every gray in the vicinity to possess her, pulls out the various consumed souls from daisies, and finally casts her out so she withers and dies once and for all. Alex is then determined to find Darlington amongst, uh, in the, behind the veil, like in the land of the dead, um, where grays are, since she is convinced that he was in fact not human, but part demon for a dumb fuck reason that the greys would murmur gentleman demon in French or something whenever they saw Darlington and demons are the only thing that can survive a hell beast consuming them. Here ends the shitty summary of this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really took a nosedive. Yeah, that was Bro, uh, right at the quite end there. lengthy. Woo. That was like seven or eight paragraphs long, a full like 10 minutes over here. Or so. There's a lot to cover there. Thank you for taking that part. And yeah, boy, does this just take a turn for like the, it's like, uh, okay. I, I feel like we should just get into the, the critique of this book now, which generally for me is like, it starts out pretty decent, holds its own for a while, and then nosedives into young adult novel territory right at the very end. Yeah, it gets really lame right at the end. But um, anyway, so let's talk, let's talk about all the things we liked. Yeah, for like I just said, for the most part, the mystery aspects are mechanically well done. There's not too many loose threads happening, even though there's a lot of threads to juggle between um, the Tara Hutchins murder, the whole bridegroom um, previous 19th century murder thing the mis- happening. The mystery about Alex's past, the current mystery of what the fuck's going on with all these societies and her learning magic. Yeah, there's kind of a lot all at once. I find that the, most, except for the part with the whole Professor Belbum bursting in at the end to do her evil monologue speech, 
it mostly kind of dovetails together nicely for me in the way that the bridegroom stuff was involved in the Tara Hutchins things and, you know, wrapping up Alex's ability to possess Greys, you know, with that crime scene at the start of the book with uh, you know, how she survived that. It's kind of okay. I So I disagree on that point because I think that Bell Bomb Daisy suddenly or Daisy Whitlock suddenly being the villain seemed extremely like, Oh fuck. How do I connect the shit? while all, while also surprising the reader. Like it just came off to me as really, really just slapping things together. I, I think that there, there was a better, there would be a better way to make the bridegroom Daisy stuff work. Um, without it, without it being that it just seemed like a lot. Anyway, continuing. It does um, seem it does seem like she literally does burst in at the end to reveal her evil plan suddenly. I do think the author had planned that from the beginning. I do agree with you that it could have been sort of breadcrumbed out a little bit better, maybe a lot bit better. But mm-hmm. aside from that, all the other stuff, like there's a sort of out of chronological order telling of the events that makes things somewhat murky. Maybe for some it might be overly confusing, but I kind of dig that style of revealing certain pieces of whatever mystery they're focusing yeah, on at I, the moment. Yeah, I do too. I like that style too. Like where, you you know, it's a little Tarantino-y where you start in the middle and go to the end and then back to the beginning and then to the end again or whatever. Um, yeah, so it's it's told a little bit out of order and I also like that. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, so Alex overall, I think we agree is a, is a pretty good character. She has a no bullshit approach that doesn't get like too edgy and her motivations seem realistic. You know, um, she sees Yale as a second chance after a traumatic childhood, but doesn't acquiesce to them entirely since they could have protected her from a lot of that trauma because they had been tracking her her whole life, but then just never intervened until they needed her basically, which is massively fucked up. Yeah. Um, and generally, the other characters are also good. Dawes is charming. Darlington is a pompous shit, but works as a mentor type. And um, Detective Turner is good as an I'm too old for this shit law enforcement type. Yeah, he's basically that cop that's like, you know, like, let's just get down to I, I don't I don't want to deal with any of this shit. He her, him and Dawes and Alex have some really good figuring it out scenes. I just every time Detective Turner was on the page, I imagined him as um uh Detective Finn Tutuola, Ice T's character yes. from SVU, 100% on that same is page with like you, is like one thousand percent him, and it's yeah. perfect. Um, so you're telling me that they used yes. a man my, <laughs> that there was a magic portal under here that they used for glamours. And- yeah, I highly recommend if you read this. Imagine Detective Turner as Ice T in his role as Finn Tutuola. Um, yeah, I mean, I think all the characters were very realistic and believable, except. For the Daisy Bell Bomb thing, which we'll which we'll talk about more Generally, later. Generally, all the villains were kind of trash. <laughs> yeah, but all the people that you spend a lot of time with were very, very believably done. Um, another thing I really loved, uh, no overtly sexual tension, no sex scenes, no stupid flirting. The only sexual stuff is relevant and the text doesn't linger on it in a voyeuristic way. Very well done. I mean, there's. it's not like there's no sexual anything. There's like a scene where Darlington is essentially drugged by manuscript and he has this sort of like trippy scene where he's seeing Alex in an extremely sexual manner and they kind of like sleep together in a bed overnight and in the morning he's kind of cuddling up on her. And But that's sort of treated as this sort of like... Uh, uh, he was taken advantage of and he feels really bad about. Yeah. I mean, thing. he was, he was, he was drugged by manuscript and because they were trying to embarrass him and they did. Uh, so he has feelings for Alex, but he tries to maintain a professional distance about it, which is much more interesting than just, yeah. I don't know, diving and, into it. Yeah. And neither, and nothing really ever happens on the page. The most that happens is what Chris just described the weird cuddling after he has that drug, but that's it. I mean, it's clear that they're, developing feelings for each other but we'll get there in a minute uh anyway yeah i think that and you know we said that there is sexual assault and rape discussed in the book but i again i think that the the author does a great job of just mentioning the details necessary not lingering in a voyeuristic way um and it's it's treated um with the respect it deserves and i just yeah all the all the sex consensual or not is handled very very well in this book and necessary for characterization yeah um, I really love the poem that opens this book 
and I'm going to read it. Um, it's originally in, I think it's, I don't know if it's, if this is, this isn't, it's in, um, oh my God, Ladino, I think. I don't think it's in regular Spanish. I'm not sure. Anyway, I'm going to read the English version because I don't want to fuck up anyone's language any more than I already do. Um, it's called Death and the Girl. There is a girl, a girl who does not fear death because she has her father and her mother and her 12 hunter brothers, a home of three floors and a barnyard farmhouse in the middle of the farm, an apple tree that gives love apples in the winter and summer. In the farm, there are seven grottos, each and every grotto secured. Death was light and slipped in through the lock. It's much nicer in the original language, but I just liked the poem. It's a quite nice and fitting for yeah. The yeah, book. It, it's it's good. I don't know. So many so many books open with poems and they're just lame. And I just thought that one was good. Um, Chris, if you want to get started on the next point since you started it, and I yeah. accidentally read your point earlier. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. No, that's fine. Doesn't you know we can. This is just shared document that we read for our episodes here. Yeah. Um, one thing I really dug about this book was the magic system yeah, here. Magic it was good. pretty neat overall. It it isn't really super clean and clear all the time, but I feel like that's kind of how I like my magic to be. A little bit wild, a little bit unpredictable. Um, it's much better than the just, you know, wave a wand, say a magic word shit you see in something like Harry Potter, which might work for some people. But to me, it just it takes the magic away. You know, it somehow it just makes it seem less impactful to me when it's that kind of a thing. Yeah. A lot of the things that do work instantly are like previously enchanted items or yep. particularly grown herbs which implies at least some sort of hard work being involved in anything magical. Even the stuff that can be used instantly, there was a lot of preparatory work yeah. or some ritual or something that had to go into it, some kind of effort or energy or literal blood. Something had to be given or done to make things work. Rituals are dangerous. Magic is wild. Um, and some people might be compelled to give this a sort of Harry Potter comparison because magic houses at a school, but that's where it begins and ends if you're going in that direction i don't I think this say. is at all like yeah there's nothing it's absolutely nothing like harry potter or or any of those other books like that. i okay. read some things on like some reviews online and some people were trying to compare it to that and i was like what why no, no. it has nothing to do with because yeah. magic houses at school does not a harry potter make no I, plus this is this is a real school and these houses are real except for leith like yale has these houses these societies you can go look at them. <laughs> they exist. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. I thought a lot of the magic stuff made some sort of internal sense and it was coherent enough. If you're willing to set aside some disbelief and believe that a magic system can be real. Cause for me, it was more like science. It wasn't, it wasn't, which is, you know, my jam, like magic as science makes way more sense to me. I've said this before on the podcast because I feel like a lot of science we have is, would seem like magic to people from earlier times. And it certainly seems like magic even to me a lot of the time. Um, and in the book, they even explain that uh, the med medical sciences are actually a form of magic, but they're, it's so it spreads so thinly over the world that it doesn't work as well or consistently um, as the magics that are concentrated here at Yale. Um, the, yeah, there's just enough explanation and logical connections to things that makes it feel more real than other magical systems we've read in books. For example, an herb that makes you servile. Yeah, that seems a thousand percent real. Drugs, drugs can do crazy shit. Um, a mirror that can capture and project an appearance. I mean, we have crazy photo video capabilities and holograms, so it doesn't seem too far fetched. Um, and yeah, also medicine is magic that lay people practice. And again, I really like that justification that because it's so like disparate, it's the least effective compared to the secretive, contained, and concentrated magic that the societies practice. Um, honestly, the prognostications are the only things that seem like total bullshit to me. I don't really understand how some random person's organs can tell you what stocks to sell and buy. Yeah. Like, that's the, the only thing I was like, fuck off. This doesn't make any that, sense. The fact that that's like the opening scene where someone's just digging through guts and being like, well, I guess the Dow will go up 200 points tomorrow. I, what? What? How do you... Yeah, that that to me was the thing, the only part of the magic that I was like, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> um, Although, now that I'm thinking, hearing what you're what you liked about this magic system, uh, do, Paris, you and I might have a sort of opposite feeling of what makes cool magic. 
Um, you like it when it's science based and sort of has some grounding in reality or at least something that is a- an internal measurable. logic. Yeah. And measure. Yeah. But I, I sort I like the wild aspects of it. This kind of harkens back to my thing with music is magic because it's like a little bit different for everyone that hears a tune might be affected a little bit differently emotionally or something like that. So maybe you and I have a sort of mirror image of what we like about the term magic and what we want it to be. Just no, I mean I don't I don't have a problem I don't have a problem with the slight wildness of magic. I have a problem when it makes no fucking sense or when it like you were explaining when it's so easy that you know, it's like Yeah, any, no, I anyone see, yeah. I I don't think you didn't like that aspect. It's just that we sort of have we come at it from a different angle to enter yeah. into it. Yeah. But I I agree music music is magic. Um so and uh, some other things I liked. I like the title. I think Ninth House is a simple, direct to the point title. It wasn't a dumb fucking phrase you find in the text. And, like, I mean, they say Ninth the way- House, but like it's it's not like done dramatically. It, it yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it's it's honestly a simple, good title. I know this is a we- kind of a weird thing to harp on, but so many books we've read have fucking lame titles. Um, the writing and editing were really good for a mass market book. I especially love that there were no typos and no other issues. Um, all the dialogue and internal monologues were great. Many of the things Alex thinks to herself felt very real and all too true. Um, and there's some great descriptive phrasings too. I'll, um, let me find some Alex dialogue uh, to read. All right. Yeah. So some good writing. <clears throat> Spring had come on grudgingly. Pale blue mornings failed to deepen, turning instead to moist, sullen afternoons, and stubborn frost lined the road in high, dirty meringues. I like the part where it says Anderson Cooper is actually five foot four inches tall, weighs two bills, and talks with a knee deep Long Island accent. Yes. Just because, like, just to describe how deep the glamour magic works, and uh, it's sort of a silly little. The humor is pretty good in the book, too, which is a note that you have. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Trip held his hands up in surrender, laughing uneasily. (laughs) Hey, he's just trying to get by. Trip was on the sailing team, a third generation bonesman, a gentleman and a scholar, a purebred golden retriever, dopey, glossy, and expensive. He was rumpled and rosy as a healthy infant, his hair sandy, his skin still tan from whichever island he'd spent winter break on. He had the ease of someone who had always been and would always be just fine, a boy of a thousand second chances. That's really fucking good. Yeah, I That's love... That's a really good way to characterize someone in a paragraph. Especially the, the that one little sentence about his tan coming from whatever island he'd spent his vacation on. That, if you just left it at he was tan, sure, there's something to be suggested there. But Bronze out that de- like a statue. Yeah. yeah, but like pulling the detail out that it's because of his privileged upbringing. Right, right. Is good. That's what you... That's yes. good writing, y'all. Yeah. Um. Oh, here we go. Um. We need more space, said a girl in a flowered sundress Darlington knew was Mercy Zhao, uh, piano, 800 math, 800 verbal. Those are SAT scores. Prize-winning essays on Rabelais and a bizarre but compelling comparison of a passage in The Sound and the Fury to a bit about a pear tree in the Canterbury Tales that had garnered the notice of both the Yale and Princeton English departments. And then Galaxy Stern, no high school diploma, no GED, no achievements to speak of other than surviving her own misery, emerged from the dark nook of the bedroom, dressed in a long sleeve shirt and black jeans, totally inappropriate to the heat, and balancing one end of the desk in her skinny arms. I just like the line about no achievements to speak of other than surviving her own misery. Yeah. Oh, there's this characterization of um, Mercy again, actually Mercy Zhao, one of Alex's regular roommates. Uh, it's talking about how they're decorating their dorm. In the end, she'd packed a hunk of smoky quartz that her mother had given her, her grandmother's nearly illegible recipe cards, an earring tree she'd had since she was eight, and a retro map of California, which she hung next to Mercy's poster of Coco Chanel. I know she was a fascist, Mercy had said, but I can't quit her. <laughs> just... Generally good moments of characterization like this, even for side characters, Really, the only people that don't get this treatment are a lot of the villains, which is yeah. surprising to me. Um, oh, here's a, here's a great here's a great part. Actually, speaking of, this is when Alex is talking to Professor Bellbaum well before she knows that she's evil. Um, Alex, what do you want from Yale? Money. 
Alex knew Marguerite Bellbaum would find such an answer hopelessly crude. When did you first see them? Darlington had asked. Maybe all rich people ask the wrong questions. For people like Alex, it would never be, what do you want? It was always just, how much can you get? Enough to survive? Enough to help her take care of her mother when shit fell apart the way it always, always did? Alex said nothing, and Bellbaum tried again. Why come here and not to an art school? Leith had mocked up paintings for her, created a false trail of successes and glowing recommendations to excuse her academic lapses. I'm good, but I'm not good enough to make it. It was true. Magic could create competent painters, proficient musicians, but not genius. She had added art electives to her class schedule because it was expected, and they'd proven the easiest part of her academic life. Because it wasn't her hand that moved the brush. When she remembered to pick up the sketchbook Sandow had suggested she buy, it was like letting a trivet skate over a Ouija board, though the images that emerged came from somewhere inside her. Betcha half-naked and drinking from a hole. Hellion profile, the wings of a monarch butterfly pushing from her back. I will not accuse you of false humility. I trust you to know your own talents. Bellbaum took another sip of her tea. The world is quite hard on artists who are good but not truly great. So, you wish what? Stability? A steady job? Yes, Alex said, and despite her best intentions, the word emerged with a petulant edge. You mistake me, Alexandra. There is no crime in wanting these things. Only people who have never lived without comfort derided as bourgeois. She winked. The purest Marxists are always men. Calamity comes too easily to women. Our lives can come apart in a single gesture, a rogue wave. And money. Money is the rock we cling to when the current would seize us. Yes, said Alex, leaning forward. This was what Alex's mother had never managed to grasp. Mira loved art and truth and freedom. She, want, she didn't want to be part of the machine, but the machine didn't care. The machine went on grinding and catching her up in its gears. Bellbaum set her cup in its saucer. So once you have money, once you can stop clinging to the rock and can climb atop it, what will you build there? When you stand upon the rock, what will you preach? I don't know. I just think that, like... It's, it was a really good description of the differences between people who have money and those who don't. And There's how so much good stuff packed in there, actually. There's world building about how the magic allows Alex to sort of pass as a regular student. There is the little drop of Belbum calling her Alexandra instead of mm -hmm. Galaxy in there. There's a little bit of characterization of Alex and what she wants out of this whole endeavor in there as well. And just a little bit of fun writing about what you mentioned there, the difference between people that have access to things and have privilege versus yeah, those that don't. And how women often are the ones who are more severely affected by those systems. Um, yeah. I don't know. There's, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, there's a ton of good stuff in here. I didn't even, I kind of stopped taking um, specific notes about good writing because there was, it was just all really good. I think it's like you said, except for the villains, it was, Pretty great overall. Um, it's like the villains and the ending are the real turds in this pile of otherwise pretty decent stuff. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, sorry. I'll stop going through things. Okay, so those are some examples of some good writing in the book. Um, yeah, the humor also was appropriate and darkly funny, which really breathed some extra life into the characters and text and lended to the realism. Um, and speaking of realism, although I have some qualms with the setting, which we'll get into shortly... I did think the way that everything was described was very engrossing. You know, it made me want to see the houses and tombs and the cool magical tools and artifacts. It's a really great idea to base something like this on building societies and societies that really exist and do the work to make it align with reality to further buttress the feeling that this could actually be happening over in Connecticut. Well done, as this is something I often take issue with in books. Yeah, so there's a lot to like here. And, you know, if you've listened to this point in the podcast, you either have hopefully read it already or you don't care about spoilers or anything like that. But on those merits, worth a read, probably, if this is a, a thing that interests you. However, however, <laughs> there's some weird stuff in here, too. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm probably going to say this at the end, too. But in case you want to skip over us talking about all the shit we hated, because we're going to pick apart some some details in the book. I really feel like this is a book that's like a, a nice stepping stone between like YA stuff and occult um, mystery horror that's intended for older readers. You know, like maybe you read Harry Potter or Twilight or Marked when you were like a kid or a tween and then you want to level up 
at 18 or 20. So then you pick, pick up ninth house. And then after that, you read sharp objects and then you find yourself alone in your thirties and you read house of leaves and lose your mind. (laughs) That's kind of the trajectory I see this book on, you know? Uh, so, uh, if you feel like you might be in there somewhere, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe give this a go, but, uh, for now, (laughs) if Harry Potter is still the only book you've read and people keep tagging (laughs) you in that one Facebook group, please, Please, I'm begging you to read another book, please. <laughs> Actually, yeah, this is great. If, if you have only read the Harry Potters, this is, please uh, read this I'm, next. I'm begging you to read another book. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So now we're going to talk about things we didn't like or thing, things that we thought could have been done better or that we just do not fucking get. All right, Chris, can we talk about ghost coasters? Yeah. Are there fucking ghost buildings and ghost cars and ghost toothbrushes? Like, where are we at here with shit surviving on the other side of the veil? There's this one scene that's very throwaway that literally has an illusory roller coaster or something. A a roller coaster, It's a ghoster. It's a ghoster. It's a ghost coaster. Like, that's you going up and down the ghost coaster instead of... But why... Why? <laughs> I like I understand well, I guess maybe if a bunch of people died on it. <laughs> it's just a particularly lethal coaster, <laughs> so it gets its own spectral <laughs> form beyond the veil. They just didn't tear it down. People just kept flying off. Oh, well, cuz you know like um you know, cuz whenever whenever Alex sees Grey, is what her ghost. Whenever she sees Grey's some of them do have physical things with them that were involved in their death. Like there's a woman who's mangled pushing a baby stroller because she got hit by a car with the baby stroller. There's another guy who's like in sweats and workout gear because he died working out. Like, so I don't know. I guess if the go, if the coaster was where a bunch of people died, like if it was a murder coaster. So they could pull the whole fucking coaster with them through the veil. I Is guess this... <laughs> I, that's the only way that makes any kind of yeah. sense. Shit. You know what? Hang on. I got to search the text for coaster because I think she, cause she does ultimately figure out or, or it is mentioned like, um, it's one of the things she sees as a kid that she mentions to no, her. No, 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 oh. no. This is Darlington. Darlington's experience as a child. Right. I, I don't, Someone yes. saw it. So Darl- Darlington's friend saw it when he was a kid. He had another child friend that was like, hey, look at that stuff. And everyone was like, what? No, it's not there. Um, And so that's when Darlington kind of developed an interest in people that can see ghosts and the occult. It's because he had this little friend when he was a kid who pointed over the sound they were standing at and was like, hey, look at that roller coaster. And all the other kids were like, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, is that kid going to come up in the second book as another wheel walker kill me Uh, (laughs) Darlington had cut the picture from the paper and had taped it above his desk um, and they eventually explain oh is it the legendary Thunderbolt a favorite at Savin Rock Amusement Park destroyed by a hurricane in 1938 so unless there were a bunch of people on it during a hurricane I don't really see how (laughs) particularly lax carnival or (laughs) Well, I mean, park. Chris, it was 1938. There were no rules in 1938. <laughs> yeah. There were no laws. So what if it's blowing? Come on, get on the coast. It's extra fun that way. <laughs> yeah, so unless a bunch of kids died on this fucking coaster in a hurricane, I don't know how there's a ghost coast. Or go- well, he could see the whole fucking carnival. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? what? I, don't, I don't know. That's That's a question for me. Because if that were true... Wouldn't your vision be clogged by all of the ghost cars and buildings and pets and clothes and ghost food? Like everything just you'd just be blinded by a whirlwind of ghost bullshit. So, so that's, not that's the a o- question. That's not the only time the magic system is a little messy in a way that's not the fun wild magic way, but just in a way that you're like, why didn't what? you clear yeah. this up a little bit more another example is that there are apparently three different kinds of make people do what you want magic or items there is merity which we mentioned before but there's also two other things that essentially do the same thing um merity is the sort of plant-based herb that you ingest then you have star power which is a, like a powder that yeah. you blow in people's faces or something no no, no. you put it on yourself 
Okay, yeah, and that makes people compelled to do what you want. And then you also have coins of compulsion, which are coins that you hand to someone, and they, again, they will essentially do what you want. Why do you have to have three different kinds here? Why can't you roll them all up into one thing? Maybe even just two? Star power and coin of compulsion, I feel like, could have been rolled up into the same thing. Yeah, I mean, they, they do they do have slightly different effects. Um, so Merity makes people so servile that they're like, they're like drooling desperate to please idiots. And star power is kind of that way, except people are more, rather than like um, on the floor kneeling, they just think you're so cool. And they'll do anything for you because you're like their favorite celebrity. Like they think you are basically not literally, but at that level. And then coins of compulsion is probably the most, I don't know, the most, the most, um, ca- like calm reasoned one you could get away with in public, because as long as you get someone to pick up this coin, um, they'll just answer any questions you want. Um, but they're not. It's not like they're not like salivating over you like they would for with Merity and they're not they're not um, starstruck by you as they would be with star power. They're just they're just kind of in this like robotic truth serum sort of state. So a little different, but I agree with you. That all could have been rolled up into one or maybe two things. It really seems a lot to have. Three, three different separate, things. separate things. Yeah. Oh, although, you know what? I did learn recently through sharing a news article with Chris that coins of compulsion are kind of real. <laughs> yeah. <you> know, <laughs> it, not like literal magical things, but if you've heard of, uh, what are they called? The uh, uh, challenge coins. Yeah. Police precinct or military challenge coins, which are essentially just a way to say, hey, I served in this one precinct or area of the military and we have a special motto or symbol that we use as proof that we are together in this brotherhood, and sometimes people use it to get out of traffic tickets or maybe attempts to get into the capital with a bunch of weapons. <laughs> yeah, so that's a thing. So police coins of compulsion. <laughs> Horrifying. Oh, yeah. It only work if the person you're giving it to is corrupt or will let things slide. So it's not an automatic, you know, oh, he gave this to me. I have to let him go. Yeah, but... Anyway, just left a left a bad taste in my mouth like old pennies. All right. <clears throat> so uh, there's also you have another note in there about magic issues. So um, there's this the whole so the whole thing at the end where the book really starts to nosedive um, has a part where they figure out that Darlington is a demon. They don't even he, figure but out. Like, they just not assume. Really. Yeah, they assume. they just assume he's a demon because. Only a demon can survive being consumed by a hell beast. And there's no... I mean, Darlington is a human being. I'm going to just say it. He's not a demon. But demon in the... I guess demon has a different... There's a different sense of the word. Like, not a creature from hell or the abyss. But a person who has perhaps done a thing demonic. Like, just murder. Maybe. Um... And it just, it just seemed, the whole Darlington Hellbeast demon thing was really stupid. Like, it would have made so much more sense if it was just a portal. Yeah. Why did it have to be a Hellbeast? Oh, I guess because they wanted to go to hell in the next book. Sure. Because that's how it ends, with Alex and Dawes going to hell to find Darlington. And I just think that's stupid. I understand that part of it is Alex wants Darlington to still be alive and accessible yes. instead of consumed wholly. And that's part of why she's assuming this thing. But to me, the, the part that was dumb was th- that they find out that you can become a demon if you murder someone. So they just assume that Darlington has murdered someone before so he can still be alive. Yeah. And it yeah, it seemed real. I don't know. It seemed real thrown together. They could have come up with some other way that he survived the Hellbeast. It could have not been a Hellbeast. It could have been a regular ass portal. Um, it could have it could have just been like they even say in the book. Well, it could be a portal that goes to a pocket dimension. Yeah, that would have been fine actually if you had just left it there. You could have solved the mystery of how to get to that pocket dimension. It would have been fine. The Hellbeast thing I really don't understand, except that the author must really, for some reason, want to take the characters to hell in the next book. 
Also, the I, whole gentleman. Oh, oh my God! That was that made me laugh out loud. Why I was do so all mad. The Grays speak French or something? Yeah. Well, I think they were just French Grays. I don't know, but <laughs> yeah, like it doesn't make any sense. So Alex has to go behind the veil to talk to the bridegroom. So Dawes has to drown her in in the fake Nile River in <laughs> shades of the in, away here. In uh, yeah, in um. In what fucking house is that? I, I think forget it was which manuscript. House. It might have been manuscript, yeah. And like, so she drowns so she can be de- like half dead for a few minutes to go talk to this ghost or to bond with him or something so he can do things for her. And so while she's there, there's these other greys kind of gathered behind him. And yeah, they're saying something and she can't quite put it together. It sounds a little foreign and just all of a sudden at the end she's like oh my god they were saying gentleman demon it's darlington he's a demon (laughs) what it's so silly yeah like god they're that was just the worst way the worst puzzle piece the puzzle piece covered in old candy under the couch with a bunch of cat hair on it like that's what that felt like it just (laughs) felt real uh real unfortunate and it's also stupid Gentleman, yeah, it, the it, gentleman it, it just demon. feels dumb. That's so stupid. Especially since, why would... Oh, anyway, anyway. Yeah, and, and he's a gentleman because he was from a rich family, but then wasn't. But he dresses very preppily and all that stuff. So Whatever, that, that, guys. Whatever. <laughs> that part leave. really ruined yeah. it for... That really ruined it for me. Yeah, oh, yeah, I guess my... I guess. My last critique was there are just several other ways that that all could have been spun out with Darlington disappearing more neatly than Darlington the demon. Like, okay, okay. It's just. Okay, so another point that I, this wasn't a huge issue for me necessarily, but I can't tell if I loved or hated the Yale or Ivy League stuffiness of all this magic stuff. Did it have to be another New England upper class crust kind of thing? Why does all magic have to be from this segment of society? Yeah, so this was my main, one of my main uh, issues with the book, actually. Um, You know, once again, we have magic only happening in like New England or New York. And my, my plea to writers is, can we please get some motherfucking gay black cowboy wizards from Wyoming or some shit? Like, can we just get anything else? Freshen I want to hear it up a little. I, I want to hear about Thai sorcerers. I want to hear about yeah. Arctic wizard or uh, weather mages. Like, tell me about South American magic. necromancers. Yes, I want to hear about magic that isn't just this. Like Chris said white people in new england it's always fucking new england god we're from new england I, we, we understand. had enough representation yeah that's it's, we're enough. good we're good we've got lizzie borden we've got a bunch of native massacres you know we've got all kinds of shit the whole lovecraft thing lovecraft we've got stephen king we've got i mean we're full up over here um please <laughs> please Please tell me about magic in other parts of the, this country, other parts of this continent, other parts of the world <laughs> with people who aren't kind of, I mean, I know Alex isn't rich, but I don't know. Just so She's coming into that part of society yes. to have access to these things. Yeah. And it seems there are hints of there's other magical colleges or universities or something with these little, at the start of some chapters, there's some like, parts that are taken from supposed other books or diaries or journals. No, that's other... that's all stuff from Yale though. Oh, okay. Well then yeah. fuck me. Like so then because, really Because because Yale has absorbed smaller colleges. You know how Harvard and and oh, okay. um like other colleges here have done the same where they just absorb colleges and then it becomes like the whatever college of something at Harvard, you know. That's that's what those titles are. Anyway, um please give us something else, some new flavors of magic and setting, please. I'm and, starving. And, yeah. And I mean, and my other, so the other issue is that this isn't even like a tacit thing. This is directly stated. It says in the book that magic came from Europe and that, um, and, and they don't really understand why Yale itself is, 
you know, a place of so much power. But they distinctly say in the text that magic came from Europe, the old world. And it's like, motherfucker, native people have (laughs) centuries of magical tradition. You know, whether, you know, whether obviously like whether you believe in that or not, but to try to say that North America didn't have magic before the Europeans came is fucking horseshit. <laughs> I think that is such horseshit. Um, it just seems it just seems absurd to me to say that. I, I mean, I I know this is a fictional book, but there was so much about this book that was that tried so hard at realism and it succeeded, and, and you know tried to make to really base this fictional book in a in the world we actually live in so it was surprising to me to see that in there so my only explanation is just that perhaps they're going to discover in future books different kinds of magic that that's not really true um i was also thinking that maybe yale is particularly full of magic because so many native people were murdered there by colonists i mean the Pequot massacre, I don't know how far away that was from uh Yale, but like I don't know. I was just trying to figure that out. In the um, text itself, isn't it just well, it was Belbum who kept creating nexuses when she ate other wheel walkers over the years. That- no, because she only started doing that in the late 1800s. Oh yeah. So fuck so, yeah. Yeah, yeah mm. so that doesn't actually solve everything. Um yeah, I can't I can't actually remember where that massacre happened. But anyway, I was just like, maybe I don't know. I'm hoping that uh yeah, I don't know. I'm just hoping that there's a a expansion of magic in the future books and an explanation or or, or attraction of that because it just seems kind of ugh. especially Please. since especially since Alex herself, you know, is potentially mixed and her grandmother is um definitely a magical person of ladino descent who you know like spanish jewish hebrew hebrew spanish um you know and i know that's obviously from europe slash the middle east but uh i mean it just seems weird to say that yeah anyway i've talked about this at length yeah. i'm done please uh, give us another flavor besides the plain white bread of new england white people occult please yes please uh oh yeah can we talk about how dumb wheel walkers are? How stupid <laughs> that name is? That's that's the first instance when that popped up. I was like, oh, no, this is a young adult novel. All of a sudden, oh, God, they have to give it a stupid name. Wheel walker? Like, th- they're trying to get the sense of, like, someone who can absorb or or others or walk through others or something. But, like, There's never any mention of the veil being wheel-based. No, they only mention that tattoo that Alex has that's a wheel, and that's the only connection. And I don't. Oh, well, I think they're. I think they're trying to. Um, so I think that whole that whole thing is an attempt to connect Alex's real name, Galaxy, to like, um, a constellation of stars. You know, she's a constellation of other people because you know when when Darlington is in his um whatever that drug is, Meredy Hayes, he sees Alex in a haze of stars, like a galaxy as she is. And so she's a galaxy of other people. She can be a galaxy of other people. I don't know why they didn't go with astrological, astrological star terms because galaxy Alex, right? Her grandmother's name means star. Um, it's just obvious. Like it's weird that they were going for the astrological stuff. And then they were like, but wheels though. And I think maybe they're just thinking like, because you know how normally when you see an astrological or a diagram or something, it's a it's a big circle. Yeah. Because, you know, the way that the earth tilts on its axis and, you know, the way that we see the sky is is kind of in a wheel shape. But I just think they could have called them anything like you would call them chimeras or hydras or something, you know, like one of many, like an entity that is one of many. Um, or they could have come up with some astrological term or even the name of a constellation that that would have made more sense wheel walker it even just if you just gave bad. me something a little bit more cyclic cyclic themed or round like anything besides yeah, and- just oh they're wheel walk and when there, there's the absorbing scene between belbum and alex and there's like a, a circle of flame around them that's the first time a circle thing happens and yeah. it's after the whole wheel walker thing anyway so fucking oh and here here's here's another tip maybe just don't fucking name it you could just explain that they're 
that they're special magical people that have a, a this ability and you don't need to give it a name sometimes that might make it more mysterious yeah and it god yeah honestly gentleman demon and wheel walker somehow three words really tanked this book for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's all it took um oh there was also this part at the beginning where they're talking about how the societies have to use a secret language and that secret language is dutch which made me <laughs> laugh really hard because i was like is dutch really obscure um, I mean, I guess I looked up some statistics and 27 people million, 20, 27 people million. <laughs> wow. Am I 27 million people know Dutch today? And it's the 62nd most spoken language in the world. So it's not as well known as I thought the world over, but at a major university that's super Anglo centric. I just feel like there are students who could speak Dutch or someone could just make a phone call and be like, Hey, these people are speaking. Like, I just, I feel like there is a greater chance that someone at Yale speaks Dutch, for example, than the world statistics at large. So it just seemed like a strange choice for me for a secret language that they could do magic stuff in. Why not do like Sumerian or, you know, yeah, Aramaic well, at least. God. Yeah. Or God, I don't even know. Um, like an indigenous language, like yeah, that would no. be way more secret. Like <laughs> no Dutch, where there's plenty of people that still speak Dutch. Well, and, I, and again, my whole point is that you're in a place where there's more likely to be a Dutch speaker because you're cramming all these, you know, exactly European. Anyway, um, that's just a quick little point there. Yeah, um, you you have the next point if you want to start it, and I can finish. Because this is by far one of the silliest things in the whole book. Yeah, I agree. Seeing the galaxy slash Alexandra mix-up coming from miles away. As soon as Belbum said Alexandra, yeah. that was the moment I was like, she's the she's the villain. That's, oh, I it's it's going to be her. I, yeah, I knew she was evil too when Alex was like, Belbum's the only one who's nice to me. I'm like, fucking demon. Like, I was <laughs> just like, she's it. There's a note in my text that says Bellbomb is the villain. Like Be, because as soon as she does the Alexandra thing and Alex doesn't correct her and you know she just seems to be this sort of random character in the book. I was like, this is just the, again, it's the SVU setup yep. for it was really her all the yeah. time. Yeah, and I said, you know, the name the name thing was obvious. <clears throat> She's a galaxy because she can hold others inside of her. Ooh, and her grandmother's name is Estrella, which means star, and she could ward. So it was kind of obvious what Alex's deal was from the get for me, like with her with her whole ability. Like I knew pretty early like, oh, she's going to be able to like <clears throat> cat, you know, like have have other people inside of her or be able to control them or something. Like it seemed pretty clear to me a little early on so yeah. yeah i mean it's not just having the climactic moment of the confrontation be like my name's galaxy bitch and yeah it was me. just really stupid it, it's a little uh, it feels a little silly it does it feels very like saturday morning cartoons um so next next point uh there was this ruse of darlington being alex's cousin which seemed an unnecessary layer to a story with plenty of other complications. And it's also just such an easily discovered lie. Like she could have just said he was her boyfriend or mentor for a class. And that's uh, her, him being a mentor for a class. Isn't even untrue. Like I, I don't understand why they needed that, especially since it comes up like twice and then never again in the rest of the book. I don't know why they needed that cover. It just was, again, an unnecessary addition in a book that already had a lot of moving parts. So it really didn't need to be there. <clears throat> so, so here's the big point that we've kind of alluded to a couple of times here. The main thing about this book that I think could have used a lot more time or work spent on it are the villains. You essentially have Professor Belbum as the big, true evil force. Then Dean Sandow is sort of the second layer uh, actual murderer of Tara Hutchins to, you know, get his plans to get some financial uh, windfalls for Leith House and create a new nexus. And then you also have the layer of Blake Keeley just being magically empowered sexual abuser happening. They're all just cardboard cutouts of evil person. Blake Keeley is just, he's mega rapist, essentially, with magic powers. No remorse or anything. Not that I need to have that layer all the time in every villain, but when you have that... Plus Dean Sandow just kind of being, well, I'm financially motivated. And then Belbum coming in at the last minute 
with her speech <clears throat> as Sandow is also giving his Bond villain like, well, I did it for this reason. And then Belham literally bursts, it literally bursts into the room to be, ah, you were all fools, tis I. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, yeah, the end there was like this whole anime sequence, which I really hated. It even ends in an anime way. Like, so, yeah, I obviously also agree. The villains were pretty poorly done. Um, Sandow was the obvious culprit from the very beginning. And I honestly would have liked it more had he not involved Blake Keeley at the end there. That piece of the story felt very over to me. Blake Keeley seemed- comes in using star power to compel Alex to do things. He's been given that from Dean Sandow to attack Alex and get rid of her, essentially. And it just seemed kind of soap opery rather than a clever cover up on Sandow's part, you know? Um, it, and obviously, it would probably take some, you, to, you listener, to read the text to understand what we mean, but it just didn't feel necessary. Um, oh, the other thing that made no sense about Sandow, I was so confused by him being close with Tara, yet there being no record of that by phone or email or post and no one ever saw them together. It would have made way more sense for him to just quietly shuffle all responsibility onto that house. He was going to throw under the bus anyway. Why even, why even come out with this? He was going to throw, um, was it manuscript or no, uh, might've been, uh, Aurelian. Yeah. One of, one of the houses he, he was going to throw under the bus and it's like, if you're really the big evil villain, why wouldn't you just quietly let that happen? And also, yeah, at the in his in his villain Bond villain monologue at the end, he's like, "Tara, help me take care of my wife." And you're like, "What? How is what? Yeah. <laughs> how is how is how did no one ever see you and Tara together? And how was there no trace of your relationship with her anywhere?" And they don't explain it by saying like, "Oh, I had." I had manuscript or Aurelian do some magic or lo- or the whatever. Like, it's just like not explained how that is somehow totally secretive and no one ever knew about it. Cause he said that Tara was there to help his wife through her cancer. So, and uh, so she it probably would have come up. Someone would have spotted somewhere, made a phone call. Hey, come over today to help. I don't know. Yeah. It just seemed really odd that this girl dies and she's like a really close friend of the Dean who's like, at his house all the time with his dying wife, or I mean, his wife is dead by the time the book starts, but it's like, how do you know what, like, Tur- is Turner a really bad detective? Like, I'm not <laughs> yeah. sure how that didn't enter the file on this murder. Uh, just very strange. Um, oh, yeah. So, for Bell Bomb, God, this book would have been so much better if it ended with, like, you know, Alex discover Alex confronting Sandow in a different way. Like, let's say Sandow lets this other society take the fall, um, you know, and then um, Alex is working on getting Darlington back and then Sandow slips up, you know, and says something and then Alex confronts him and then, you know, she kills him or something. I don't know, you know, whatever or whatever. She confronts him and then he is banished or something. I don't know, some, some end to that. And then, like, smash cut to summer alex is working in bell bomb's office and then she's working at one of her parties and one night bell bomb tries to come on to her but actually tries to suck her soul out which would have been a way better ending to this rather than barging into the room and being like i am the supreme womb teeth of new haven it is like, i you're having your evil plan discussion i have to come in here and tell you my evil plan it's so much better you guys this well, evil plan you had is stupid in comparison to mine but like the the false stop and then smash cut to summer when everything's fine and then her trying to take alex's soul then would have been such a better ending i can't believe that she didn't do that um oh yeah there's also this there's also this like funny note to bell bombs immortality so her immortality is limited only to New Haven, and if that were me, I'd probably fucking pass. Yeah, like, like, I'm, all right. I'm good. I'm good. I'm all right. I, I, I'm, you know, it's kind of a limiting immortality. Well, unless I don't, I don't know because uh, which house? The house that does portal magic. I forget which one that is. Scroll they and have key, I believe. Scroll and key. They have portal magic that can take you anywhere in the world briefly if you want. So like. Would she maybe just disintegrate? If, maybe if you go if she... far enough, you instantly decay, but you know, I don't know. Yeah. 
maybe. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Is immortality in New Haven, Connecticut really worth murdering other women for a decade and a century and a half? I'm going to say no. I'm going to give that a big no. Especially if no. you kind of know there's an afterlife and it's not completely the end. Right? Yeah. Like yeah. Song. And also, I, yeah, I didn't I didn't understand where Daisy Bell, Daisy's Daisy Bell bombs malice came from. Um, I mean, I guess being a young woman during an, a, the oppressive age that she grew up in in the uh, late 1800s, mid yeah. to late 1800s. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, but she was young. She was what? 18 when she died not like 20 tops or something yeah she's pretty young so uh, yeah i question her motives you know i guess i guess she knew she had magic and was like trying to develop her magical abilities but i don't yeah i don't know i mean i guess some people are just assholes right right yeah yeah but some people just just want (laughs) to swallow your soul for all eternity yeah man sometimes that's just how some people be um, yeah, and the other weird thing about this the soul eating is that when uh when your soul is eaten by a person who can consume souls, you don't go to the afterlife. You just exist in this galaxy inside of them. Um again, harkens back to Alex's real name. Uh I don't know. I mean, I guess if you got a few others in there, at least you got company. I, I don't know. Is it compartmentalized? <laughs> yeah, you know. I, I'm not really sure. How long have um, you been in here for? Uh, you know, 50 years. It ain't so bad. Yeah. She just teaches classes all the time. <laughs> yeah. And well, and then she was like, oh, and I keep changing my identity. And I'm like, don't you think somebody would have noticed something fishy that you've been the like, it would be different if she could go to different towns. But once it was like, I have to stay in New Haven. I'm like in the same body, same body, same town. How do you get away with that for 150 years? I I don't know. It seems like a difficult ask. It can't just be a dye job, right? No, because she still had the white hair that yeah. Gladys had. So oh. she didn't even dye her fucking hair. I don't know. Maybe she had it before. <laughs> I don't know. It just seems really strange. Um. Anyhow, some other things. Um. I was surprised that Dawes wasn't evil or dead by the end. I actually thought that she might have been a agent of chaos. But then, you know, as the book went on, I realized that wasn't the case. No, she's just a charming little helper friend. Um, I was also surprised they didn't get Darlington back by the end. But then I realized it was an intentional cliffhanger to sell more books. So then it made more sense to me. Yeah. Um, which I, I like. I like that the Darlington mystery was not finished um, because, you know, you can't have your character get everything they want in the end, which is good. Um, uh, there's also the the issue of. Once again, we've got another sort of self-insert author um, here. Like this author, Leigh Bardugo, she went to Yale. She's, um, oh shit, I had all the things that were that were Also lined of up. Ladino descent, I believe. Uh, she's Jewish. I don't know if she's Ladino, but I, maybe she is because she, I think, I think it mentioned that she was Jewish. Hang on. I might, fuck, I thought I wrote this down. I'm really sorry. Yeah, she's sorry. She's from Jerusalem. She was born in Jerusalem. She's American. Um, and she grew up in Los Angeles, which is where the character grew up. Um, oh, she is a non-practicing Spanish and Moroccan Jew and Lithuanian Russian on the other. So she is, yeah, she is Ladino, technically, I guess. I mean, not like living that life or anything, but she has that heritage. She attended Yale. Um, so... Yeah, there's just a little bit of like, oh, I'm the main, I'm a little bit the main character, you know, um, which I guess it, it obviously we're not talking about something as egregious as like Maradonia or or some of the other books we've no, read. No, this or, is or by marked, far but... a very small example of this, and honestly, not too worth being picked on. But at the same time, it's it, people you hear the idea of write what you know and i think a lot of people assume that means take my literal life setting and circumstances <laughs> and insert them into the book so that they're more realistic that way because i know that setting well enough to accurately portray it what i really think write what you know means is talking about emotional experiences yeah, that you've exactly. had and the you know the weight they've had on you or challenges you faced it doesn't have to be the exact thing, but at least relating it back to the characterization more than the detail, the, the extraneous window dressing details of a character. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Chris there. Um, and again, <clears throat> like Chris said, this isn't like a 
a big deal. It's just something I noticed and I was like, oh man, not this again. But at least it's not a total self-insert. I mean, Lee Bardugo doesn't, at least on a surface level, doesn't seem much else like Alex Stern. Um, Sort of similar to this, talking about Alex Stern, the main character, I'm really not a huge fan of a whole book being, I'm a special lady and some cute boy likes me. We've talked about this on the show before. Um, It's just overdone. Like, sure, Alex is flawed, but she's also super cool, better than everyone else, even the super special people. Whoa! Because her flaws are all excusable due to, like, grooming and assault. Um, While this is obviously a far more skilled, believable, and polished adult version, by the end, I felt like I was reading a well-aged marked or something, which made me feel a little disappointed. I think if they didn't have that very young adult novel flavored ending sequence, it would have come off a lot nicer, a lot more mature in that sense yeah i mean i guess i guess i just so i did like that alex and darlington never had a there wasn't a real romance going on you know it's it's speculative at best which i appreciate but the fact that she you can kind of clearly see she cares about him and may it's it maybe it will develop into something later i'm just like i just i just didn't want that to be a part of it i wanted him to just be her mentor I didn't want any of this romance sexual. I didn't even want a sniff of that because Alex is someone who has clearly been extremely traumatized and taken advantage of by men. So I I just wanted a clean break for this character, you know, like a a, a healthy relationship with a man that didn't have any romance or sex. (laughs) And, and that's kind of what I, what I want out of, I think a lot of my characters. Um, But it was still, done in a much better way than other books we've read i guess my point is there are still sprinklings of those classic problems that we see in Mm -hmm. all in a lot of books um oh yeah i mean i said i didn't want to steal this from you but yeah the book totally nosedives and ends like a a young adult like a poorly written young adult book or an anime in, in like a series of soft unsatisfying farts or perhaps sneezes that only tingle and never resolve kind of a thing you know uh, it's real, real unfortunate. This this really segues into the whole can we fix it thing. For me, it's really that ending sequence and the way the villains are treated that could have used a little tuning up. Belbum just bursting in with her no tis I evil monologue thing and doing that before consuming Alex seems just cliche. Your mm-hmm. version where it happens months later and there's no monologuing about it. I don't understand why she would burst in and monologue and then start trying to consume. Why not just consume right immediately and not have to tell anyone what's what's up here because that also she they're at a party. That's more time for someone to walk by and be like what's going on in here? Oh fuck. Oh yeah, wasn't the door also not totally closed? No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a detail about how wait, let me make sure. There, I swear to God, there's a detail about it being slightly ajar, and I'm like, it's like it's like that Simpson sequence. It's like, good lord, what is going on in there? Oh, it's just the Northern Lights. <laughs> just it's just Professor Bellbaum consuming Alex Stern. Just a consumption happening. Just a soul consumption. Don't worry about it. That that's really my major beef with this. The, a lot of the rest of the book I enjoyed. I wanted to sit down and read to to see what happened as I was reading this book. A rare thing in a lot of terrible book club books. Usually I have to force myself to sit down and get through it. This one I wanted to sit yeah. down and see what was going to happen because it was interesting and well done. It was a fun read for the most part until we got to these cliche endings. Yeah. Um, so for my part of the can we fix it, um, honestly, I think this could have been really good with some minor changes. I wanted to keep turning the page. I chuckled. I felt a trauma bond with Alex. And this style of magic in the present day works so much better for me than a lot of the other styles we've read in other books. My major issues could be resolved if that if that last chapter or so was rewritten with some slight adjustments accordingly in the earlier text. The Daisy Bell Bomb, Sandow, Two-Tier, and Boss Fight you know, the lame wheel walker name, Darlington being a gentleman demon slash eaten by a hell beast. Um, there were some other minor things that could be done to tighten it, as we mentioned earlier. But overall, this is a fun, compelling, like lazy Sunday read and felt like a good stepping stone. Like I said earlier, for, you know, from YA stuff to more serious, intense, dark or occult novels. So like I said earlier, you know, if you read 
Harry Potter or Twilight are marked when you were a kid or a tween or a teen and you want to like level it up, you could go to ninth house and then, you know, maybe you go to like sharp objects and then you find yourself, like I said, alone in a rabbit hole reading House of Leaves, losing your mind in your 30s. Um, I, I just really think that's a nice arc. Um, so I guess, as Chris said, if uh, if you've only ever read Harry Potter, maybe read Ninth House. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if Overall, nothing, if nothing for the wonderful character portraits of yeah. some of the main characters, um, I might recommend this to someone. I, I really might. Yeah, I might. I might. If if you're a person who doesn't mind those sort of maha villain endings, then yeah, I might recommend it to someone. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. That we have anything to do? No. But um, well done, Lee. Lee or Lay Bardugo. I thought this was pretty okay. Yeah, pretty I don't. Okay. This is is this her first novel? I'm not sure. No, can... no, no, no. She wrote okay. um some YA series before this. Oh, okay. Well, there it is. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Right. Um, shit. Let me go back to her Wikipedia. Uh, she's written Ninth House, The Language of Thorns, Six of Crows, Shadow and Bone, King of Scars. Um, yeah, she's okay. written many books. Um, so seasoned author, and it shows. Yeah. Um, I don't know what her other books are about. I just was told that it was a... Oh, she also apparently wrote a Wonder Woman book. Um, <laughs> Interesting. I should ask my brother about that. Um, yeah, there's something called The Severed Moon, a year-long journal of magic. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything about these other books, but Ninth House was pretty okay. I, again, I think this is a really, yeah, as, I don't know if she meant it to be like a stepping stone out of YA, but it really feels that way. Um, not, and, and I don't mean to say that as like, you have to grow out of YA. I know plenty of adults who like reading yeah. young adult fiction, and there's nothing wrong with that. I guess I'm just saying, if you're looking to kind of read things that are similar but different. Perhaps if you know someone that is reading a lot of that stuff and you want to sort of nudge them a little further... This might be a, a nice, nice gift or recommendation. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, um, <clears throat> thanks once again to my friend Liz for recommending this to us after she uh, put this in her do not finish pile uh, in 2019. We finally got around to reading it. Thanks, Liz. Um, thank you to our patrons. Oh, the patron ranks are getting long. Thank you. Thank you to Greg, Veronica, Will, D, Jared, Lynn, Sinia. Yakub, Bobby Black Cat, Jensina, Mayo Cat, Elliot, Kieran, Martin, Jay, Scott, Luchek, Jay again, CTAP1, and our newest patron, Mutzik. Yay, Mutzik. Welcome. Welcome. Mutzik. Welcome. I hope you enjoy your ride on the ghost coaster. Um, <laughs> hopefully, we'll hear from you soon. Thank you very much for becoming a patron of Travel Book Club. If you also would like to support the show, um, you could to become a patron. Um, but if you don't want to do that, or if you can't afford to, you could subscribe to our YouTube channel. That'd be really helpful actually, because if we get to a thousand subscribers, we may be able to monetize our YouTube space, which would be really helpful for us. Um, we're, we're a little more than halfway to monetization. So if you have a YouTube account, just go ahead and click that subscribe button. You don't even have to watch anything on it. You just literally click a button once and you've did, you've done your duty for the terrible book club. Um, if, if you're not interested in that, you could subscribe and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Goodreads. You can also rate and review us on um, Podbean, Podchaser, or iTunes, Apple Podcasts. A, a review on Apple Podcasts would be great. We haven't had a review in a bit, so if anyone could give us a nice review, that'd be great. An honest review. An honest review is good. Um, if you want to reach out to us directly, you can always contact us at terriblebookclub at gmail.com, or you can send us a message on Goodreads, Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Um, yeah, I, I guess those are all the ways to contact us. Uh, we're actually, we're doing a double header recording today. So we'll be recording episode 105 right after this. Um, Just an addendum to all that, Paris. Don't forget to share the show on social media or tell some folks about it to help expand the Terrible Book Club family here. We're trying to meet some goals here in 2021 and we'll be doing our part in some ways, but you could do yours too. Also, if you don't want to be a patron, you could also just send us a tip on Kofi, which oh, is yeah. a platform that we only mention sometimes here because we're still kind of getting it into the flow of the end of the show script here. Yeah, and I haven't I haven't really done much with it. But yeah, if you want to just send us like a one time tip, you can do that on Kofi. I think you can also do that on Patreon, but it's like more annoying. Kofi, it's yeah. really simple. You literally type your amount in and 
you know, your payment method and that's it. Um, so if, you know, if you just want to throw us like a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars one time, you can go on Kofi, ko fi.com slash terrible book club and do that. Um, but yeah, mostly like Chris said, just sharing the show or, or telling someone about it is, is super helpful for us. Um, yeah, in any case, I don't know that we have any other news. Nope. We're just going to have to head into the next episode that we're recording, which is uh, it's a fun one, I think. This one was a little bit more, you know, it was a good book, so we had a little bit more serious discussion and critique. The next one, far sillier. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to take a little break, and then we're going to record that one. And I, it's going to be a very different Paris and Chris on the next episode of Terrible Book Club. We were changed mm-hmm. by the book in episode 105. Hang on All to right. your butts, everybody. Hang on to your butts. That's a clue. Butts. <laughs> butts is a clue for the next book. I'm not kidding. It's a clue. All right, y'all. Um, yeah, actually, before we go, I would like to say that um, four years ago, um, this week, we restarted Terrible Book Club, and we have been on the air consistently since then because we started on... Uh, Trump's inauguration <laughs> and mm-hmm. today Biden was sworn in as president to succeed him. So as so, we recorded, as this. we recorded, sorry, we missed the inauguration. for this recording. <laughs> oh, that's telling. Um, and no, not really. I mean, I just, I just feel like we can see the inauguration clips later, you know? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. but anyway, I just thought that was a fun memory that when we came back from our hiatus because we started the show in 2015 when we came back from our hiatus in 2017 we recorded uh i think a week into trump's presidency or something Mm -hmm. uh so just about four years ago today and what a weird what a weird uh uh side-by-side timeline like terrible book club and the trump presidency (laughs) oh god (laughs) just like (laughs) oh we truly live in a hell world Well, anyway, next time we'll be back in a hopefully slightly less hell, slightly less hellish world. We'll see about that. Yeah, today is supposed to be uh, a new dawn. It's kind of a reversal, though. We're really just going back to 2016. <laughs> yeah, we'll see about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll see going, about that. Going back a few years, but that's that's good. I'm looking forward to to going backward to go forward. Um, All right. I think well, I just wrote a campaign speech. All right, yeah. cool. Um, let's end we'll this. see you next time on Terrible Book Club. Uh, bye, Paris. Bye.